The next one is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless gas that is the result of an incomplete combustion between a carbon-based item like wood or coal, okay? The problem is this. It's a colorless, odorless gas. Matter of fact, and I'm just trying to prove a point, anybody could be being exposed to carbon monoxide right at this very moment, and you would never know because of the colorless, odorless products that it has. It comes from improper ventilation on like gas furnaces where the heating exchange happens or a malfunction in one of those. Matter of fact, one of the new parts of the business code now require, and I say new, it's, it may be 10 years old, that every new gas furnace has to come with a carbon monoxide detector as part of the furnace. Because if that furnace malfunctions and the pilot light goes out, the gas is still gonna be coming out and you are not going to know it. Now, I personally have had a friend when we were right out of high school that will actually succumb to this. Her gas, her heat exchange cracked, uh, heat exchanger cracked in her house with a gas furnace. And unfortunately, Darcy did not make it out. All right. So it is very possible that you could be being exposed. If you have a gas furnace, please go check your carbon monoxide detector. There are uh, ones that you can now buy that are external where you actually just plug it into the wall and when it detects something, it will go off. Mandatory detectors, like I was saying, part of the building code now requires these furnaces to have these detectors in them. Polychlorinated biphenyls. PCBs. PCBs are a dielectric oil, meaning they can handle a current, a huge current. They can also handle high temperatures, like up to 2400 degrees. And because of that, they are usually the insulation in any kind of electrical transformer or in those fluorescent light balance, ballasts in the ceiling. You cannot take a fluorescent light and just throw it in the trash because of the PCB makes that a hazardous chemical. You are supposed to repackage that fluorescent light in its box. And when it gets full, that box gets full, you call a special recycler and they come and get it because of the hazardous waste from the PCB. They can cause uh, health hazards. They were banned in 1979. So they were at least in the commercial world. So they are not used in those lighting things anymore, but they are still some bulbs out there. The other most common thing place you see them is if you've ever seen a telephone pole and at the top of a telephone pole is that gray cylinder, that is a step down transformer where the electric wire from the telephone pole goes into that transformer, it then makes it a current, con uh, current, uh, constant current, sorry, <clears throat> that leads to the house so that your house has the constant current that it needs to and required to run all your electric appliances. Well, that cylinder could have been full of PCBs and because, you know, it's been up there for 25, 30 years. No one's ever changed them out. <clears throat> so you've got to be careful of those. And we'll touch on why that's important here in just a minute. Now, the next one in the alphabet is CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, chlorofluorocarbons. <laughs> Say that three times. That's why they call them CFCs. <laughs> They are a, a non-toxic, non-flammable chemical to the human. But what they do is they deplete the ozone layer. And if you guys have heard, uh, there was a lot of commercials years ago, and maybe they still have them, uh, about, you know, not mowing your lawn during the middle of the day. 
because that ozone can be created, not uh, filling your car up when it's above a certain temperature, because that free radical oxygen binds with O2, which makes O3, and that's the ozone, and that's not the good ozone. Um, CF, uh, the CFCs were mainly done, used, or quit using them in 1996. Uh, another good example of a CFC is a refrigerant like Freon. That's one. That's why Freon costs so much if you ever have Freon put in your air conditioner because it has to be done and reclaimed so that it doesn't escape and there's have to have special training. So to have that done, it is uh, very expensive to do. And you have to be careful on how you get rid of it. That's why you hire a special refrigerator trained person in the CFC so they can put them new in. Now, there have been some products that come out. And I think it's RF-121A or 112. That is a man-made version of this without that CFC constituent that they use. Mold. Mold is gold if you're an investor because a lot of people just freak out with mold, all right? And there are over 5,000 different kinds of mold out there. When I was in grad school and PhD school, we actually did a whole section about this and learned about how there are different types of mold. Now, here's the problem with mold. Mold is an allergen. It works like an allergen. It creates spores, and some people are allergic to those spores. So the problem that you have, because of the interaction of this mold with a human, and every human has different sensitivity, there could be a range of issues. Here's an example. Did you guys know that penicillin is mold? It comes from penicillium. Some people actually eat it, right? You take penicillin pills. Whereas some people are allergic and can't take penicillin. And if you've ever been into a doctor's office in the last 10 years, the one of the things they ask you is, are you allergic to penicillin? Because that is a mold. It is, comes from, extracted from, created from a mold derivative. And because of that wide range of susceptibility, the only thing that you are going to see, or the one thing you will never see, maybe that's a better way, are any actual true standards. Think back to what I was talking about with lead-based paint. We know at a certain level of exposure to lead, every human reacts the same. And I said that back then because I was going to use it to emphasize why mold is problematic. Because not every human reacts the same, i.e. the penicillin example. And because of that issue, there is never going to be a true standard for mold. Do not confuse this word guideline with the word standard. There are guidelines for remediation on how you clean it. There may be guidelines on how you test for it, but there is no standard like in radon, when I told you above four picocuries, you have an issue. Below, you're okay. There is no standard like that with mold because of the human susceptibility. My uh, ex-wife, for instance, she literally could go to a house, stop at the front door and go, can you smell that? And I'm like, no, I, I don't. She's like, there's mold in here. She was highly susceptible. She took shots every Monday for like three years for her allergies while we lived in Texas going, and I was going to Texas A&M. So she 
was one that was very susceptible and could not take penicillin, by the way. She was allergic to penicillin. Whereas I never had an issue with it. So that's the issue that we got. got. Now, there are a, a number of lawsuits that have been growing. Um, I will tell you that I think this is chasing windmills because it's hard to prove that that one mold caused all your allergies. Um, because typically, if you're allergic to one thing, you're allergic to at least two or more. So it's hard to prove, oh, hey, uh, it was the mold. I'm sure, it wasn't the sunlight or the grass or the pollen or things of that nature. So mold is a susceptibility issue. Here's the issue. Mold is a systemic problem of water, all right? Because you need food, water, and darkness. Typically, when you see mold, mold, while it is problematic to people, is truly not the problem. There is a water leak somewhere in that residential property. Mold cannot just grow without moisture. So, un, uh, roof leaks, unvented bathrooms, that's a problem when the moisture from a shower gets in there. Uh, outside water that may be leaking into the crawl space. All of those are the true issue that need to be found. Mold is like the key that goes, hey, there's water, there's water, there's water. It's the warning signal when you see mold. Dude, there's a water issue somewhere. That is what we have got to find. There was a number of years ago, I was going with an investor to look at like a 52 unit apartment complex. And when you walked into the apartment complex, you walked in on the main front door, but then you walked down to the living room or walked up to the bedroom area. There was really nothing on the main floor, but the landing and a coat closet. <clears throat> so as Carrie, uh, his name was Carrie, went down, and this was a, a bank-owned home, it, a bank-owned property, rather. It had been boarded up because it had been taken through a foreclosure from the investor. Well, the bank boarded it all up, these three buildings with these 52 units in it, obviously to keep from vandalism or trespassing. So when we, Carrie and I went in with the maintenance man, he opened the door, we walked in to the uh, landing, and then we started down the steps. And <clears throat> as Carrie got to the bottom, he stepped on the bottom main floor, and you literally heard the water. And uh, I, I'll do this for you. It sounded like this. <clears throat> Did you get that? <laughs> That's what it sounded like. As he stepped down, you heard the squish and he immediately pulled his foot back up and he's like, dude, you've got a flooded floor. And the maintenance man's like, huh, it wasn't like that the other day. And then the maintenance man kind of bent over and he shined his flashlight across the floor. And it was absolutely the most gross thing that I've probably ever seen. And at that time, it was still the Nokia phones, no cameras because I wished I would have a picture of this, I would show it to you. Along the main floor with the carpet were the little mushrooms that were growing in the property. And you know what I mean if you've ever seen those mushrooms, the ones that kind of... look like that. <clears throat> They were all growing along the carpet, and there literally were thousands of them on this main floor. And I remember Carrie looked at me and goes, okay, I'm out. That's all we needed, and he was done. What had happened was there was vandalism. Somebody had broken the back board and cracked it, so there was a crack. And when it rained, it rained in on the floor. And then, of course, in the Indiana summer, it was 95 degrees, enclosed darkness, wet moisture. And this was actually growing out of the carpet. It is it was gross, man. And I said at the time, uh, I think I'm going to go home and clean my carpets tonight. Because thinking that that food was in that carpet 
was probably one of the mentally gross things I've seen in the real estate world. So now when it comes to groundwater, and if you remember, we had touched on groundwater way back when we had talked about flood plains and flood water and groundwater. Groundwater is the public water supply that is used by an area of the city or an area of the state. They can be contaminated, especially when it comes to private wells or water systems. That contamination can come from what's called runoff, runoff of waste disposal sites like dumps, trash uh, things, leaking underground storage tanks, which we're going to get to. People that may have used pesticides and herbicides on their farm. Or, back to what we talked a minute ago, those cylinders on the top of a telephone pole that contain PCB, maybe that telephone got hit by a car, <clears throat> broke it over. When it landed, it cracked that, and that water seeped into the ground. So all of this contamination is an issue when it comes to runoff and groundwater protection. And the problem is that groundwater is free flowing and may cross several property lines. And because of that, it could spread far from the source. There could have been an exposure or a contamination two miles down the road, and it still winds up in the farmer's water system because of the well. So there are many federal regulations that garner or control what actually gets put in the ground. And they created this thing called the Safe Drinking Water Act. All right, the Safe Drinking Water Act, which requires people that have a spill to report it so that they can check for contamination and potentially stop it before it may get to a water source, okay?